everything we see around us, from the air we breathe to the light coming to our eyes, is made up of smaller components. And the best theory we have for how physics works at the scale of atoms, molecules, and the individual photons making up light is quantum theory. And at that scale, physics behaves differently from how we might ever expect. One of the first things that behaves really differently from how we might ever expect is quantum entanglement. I can ask you a question. How long does it typically take for the things that you do to influence other people? If, if someone else is in the same room as you, you can probably influence them right away, almost. If someone's down the block, it might take a little longer. If someone's on the other side of the country, it might take a little bit longer. But with quantum entanglement, it turns out that you can influence other people and what they see instantaneously, no matter how far away they are, even if they're at the other end of the universe. And so because of that and things like that, we have to put on a different sort of thinking cap and use a different framework when understanding things behaving at this small scale of atoms and molecules. Those new ways of thinking turn out to be useful. You might ask, how can we actually know these things? How can we know about the properties of these individual components if we never breathe air one molecule at a time and we never see light one photon at a time? And it turns out statistics has answered the question. We can look at the correlations between different measurements. So today I'm gonna to tell you about quantum correlations. I am a theoretical quantum physicist and I study quantum correlations. I study what makes quantum correlations different from what we might ever expect. And I study what makes quantum correlations useful. And today I'll tell you a bit about how they can be useful for making better detectors and sensors like high precision microscopes and high precision telescopes capable of seeing things that otherwise we would never be able to see. So to start out, what do you think about when I say the word correlation? Correlation. You might have heard the phrase correlation doesn't equal causation. So you might, you might have an inkling that correlations imply some sort of relationship between multiple events or between multiple measurements or between multiple properties of some object. And we can understand this with an everyday example. Suppose, that somebody from every household goes grocery shopping once per week, and you wanna figure out how they choose when to go shopping based on just looking at the entrance of the store and not asking anyone any questions. So if everyone just chooses randomly what time to go shopping, then we would say that their shopping times are uncorrelated. And that's in the sense that if you see one person going in and everyone's just choosing their, their times to go in randomly, then there'd be no reason to expect more people to show up soon or fewer people to show up soon. There's no correlation. So seeing one event doesn't make you think that more or less of some other event is gonna occur. Then we can think about ways of changing this scenario so that there could be a positive or a negative correlation if people don't just choose randomly what time to go shopping. So for example, suppose more people go grocery shopping after work. Then if you see one person going in, you should expect more people to go in soon, even if you don't even know what time of day it is, because there's this positive correlation that when one person goes in, there's more likely to be a bunch of people there at the same time. And then we can think about ways where there could be a negative correlation. For example, let's say the grocery store gives each person an individual time to go grocery shopping. Then when you see one person going in, it would be less likely that someone else would be following them anytime soon. So we would call it a negative correlation. And then just by observing these things, these aggregate properties, without asking anyone individual questions, you can figure out whether there's a positive correlation or a negative correlation or no correlation at all between their shopping times. And by looking at this correlation, you can understand some properties of the individual people and what they choose. Now you might be, surprised to hear that this model for people going grocery shopping is actually a fantastic way of describing the photons coming out from a laser. So if we go back over a century ago, there were some experiments with light 
that didn't make much sense unless people realized the light had to be fundamentally made out of tiny, indivisible packets of energy known as photons. But these photons sometimes behave in ways like particles so they could bounce off of things like bowling balls and sometimes behave like waves so they have some extended um, properties over all space, more like plucking a guitar string. And so then if light has to be made, made out of these, these tiny packets, then when you turn on a light bulb or you turn on a laser, millions of these photons start streaming out at the same time. And for a laser, they're streaming out in the same direction. That's why it focuses so well on some target with your laser pointer, let's say. And so you could ask, do these photons know about each other? Are they correlated? Do they all come out all together with some positive correlation? Do they all come out one after each other, filing along in, in single files, streaming out with negative correlations? And it turns out that the photons coming out from a laser have no correlations at all with each other. They each get emitted in some ways independently that the likelihood of one coming out is not related to the likelihood of the next one coming out. And the neat thing about this is that physicists can actually change these correlations between photons. So using some clever tricks, we can tune the correlations so that they become more positive so that the photons all do start to bunch together. Or we can make them more negative so that the photons do stream out one after the other and by making light with photons with these interesting correlations, we can actually use that light to do interesting things that I'll tell you about for making really high precision sensors and detectors. So one useful thing that people measure with light all the time is called spectroscopy. The idea of spectroscopy is to shine light with a bunch of different wavelengths on an object and figure out what that object is or what the material is just based on what wavelengths of light do get absorbed and what wavelengths of light don't get absorbed. So if you think about light, light can uh, refract through a prism or through rain droplets in the air and you get some sort of rainbow with all these different colors and all the different colors correspond to different wavelengths of light. And also when you see objects, you're seeing the light that's reflecting back off of them that wasn't absorbed so since objects have different colors, it's because they absorb and don't absorb light of different wavelengths. So what you can do is actually figure out that each type of material has a different fingerprint for a variety of wavelengths of light that it does and doesn't absorb. And so by shining light with a variety of wavelengths, you can look at this fingerprint and figure out what's there. So for example, let's say you wanna know whether there's pollution in the air. And what you can do is figure out that some wavelength of light makes it through the air no problem. You shine your blue light through the room, it makes it from one end to the other. But that some particular pollutant absorbs light of that particular color, that particular wavelength. And what you can do is shine that light through the room and see if it all gets through. If it doesn't get through, you know that there is something in the way, just like if there are fewer people in the grocery store, you might think that there is a roadblock outside and you can use that as a way of detecting how much uh, pollution is in the air. And when you think about this in terms of photons, we can, we can have a much deeper analysis. If we think back to the grocery store analogy, this is like trying to see whether or not there is a roadblock outside the grocery store. And if everyone's just going shopping randomly and you don't see so many people in the store, you can't always tell what was going on. There could randomly have just been fewer people going shopping, or there could have been a lot of people coming, but there was a roadblock, and that's why people didn't get through. And in spectroscopy, that's the, those are the two cases you're trying to distinguish between the pollution being there or not being there. So if we tailor the correlations, the quantum correlations between the photons so that they all show up at the same time, we can do much better. Because if you know for sure that your photons all show up a million at a time, then if you only detect 999,000, you know for sure that there is a roadblock there. You know for sure that there is this uh, pollution in the air in this example. And this tailoring of the quantum correlations gives you more precise measurements. You can detect uh, trace amounts of something like pollution. 
this is useful in a whole bunch of applications. Spectroscopy has a whole bunch of things like detecting toxins like carbon monoxide or detecting poison in your drink or detecting, making sure that your, your medicine that you're making has the correct purity and has all the correct ingredients in it and the correct final products. And so just by tailoring these quantum correlations, we can actually do useful things. You might say, Aaron, okay, uh, you told us this is quantum, but then you told us it's the same as a grocery store. So that's not quantum. And I'll say, okay, you're right. But there's a limit to how many people can fit into a grocery store in a given time. And with photons, there's no limit. So what's uniquely quantum mechanical about this is you can make the correlation so strong that as many photons as you want travel in the exact same place at the exact same time in the same direction, with the same wavelength, the same color. And that's something that we like to say is a uniquely quantum mechanical feature. And so by getting these extra quantum correlations, we can do useful measurements. And that's the kind of thing that I study. So there are other types of quantum correlations and there are other types of measurements and there are other ways that we can do have useful advantages from tailoring these quantum correlations. So something that I've done uh, a bit of work researching is studying whether or not your orientation in three dimensions has changed. So this is an important problem for something like navigation, say even a self-driving car, you want to be able to tell whether you accidentally turned a bit to the right or left, or in your version, maybe left or right. If you're having an airplane, you want to know if you got tilted up or down. And if you want to know exactly where you are and you're using a GPS satellite to locate where you are, you want to know if that satellite has changed its orientation so that you know exactly where it is, so you know where you are. And typically, when you want to understand something's orientation, it's like trying to, you have a globe and you want to know if it was rotated the North Pole is still on the top, or if it's on the bottom, or if it's on the side. And what you do is you compare it to, you have a globe, and you say, was it rotated? And you have two, and you see, see if things changed. But with quantum mechanics, and this analogy breaks down a little bit, but if you have a, a series of atoms, you can make them behave in such a way that it's as if though they're oriented in multiple directions at the same time. Some of their properties are as if though the globe was oriented with the North Pole at the top and the South Pole at the bottom. And they also sometimes behave as if though the North Pole was on the right and the South Pole was on the left. And sometimes a whole bunch of different orientations. By adding extra, extra quantum correlations, we add extra effective orientations that these atoms can be in simultaneously. And that gives more precision to estimating and figuring out how much your orientation has changed, which is then useful for all of these navigation type exercises. Application. We can look at other quantum correlations and, and do better for other types of measurements, which have applications in our, in our everyday lives. We can make more precise clocks by tuning the quantum correlations between atoms and photons, and by figuring out better ways of transferring energy from light to matter. And by making more precise clocks, we can do better things for scheduling, better things for traffic control, better things for air traffic control, and a whole bunch of other applications. So the main exciting thing that I, I'd like to tell you is that quantum sensing and quantum detection technologies are coming out in the near future. There are a bunch of theorists like me who work on these things all the time there are people who've shown proof of principle experiments showing that these things can actually work. There are people taking these experiments from the laboratory to industry, trying to make them ready for clinical applications and get them ready for uh, the regular person out on the street who can use these technologies in the near future. And we really think that these kinds of quantum sensing technologies will be available and useful well before a number of other quantum mechanical technologies like quantum computers or things like that, which are fascinating, but might take a little bit more time before we get there. So this is a really exciting field that I encourage you to stay tuned to because I believe there'll be lots of exciting developments in the very near future. But the main message I'd like you to take home today is about correlations. Correlations are how we 
understand any data to reveal nature's secrets and quantum correlations do exactly that. But then in turn, our ability to tailor the correlations, the quantum correlations between different components like atoms and photons and molecules leads to unprecedented abilities that lead to really cool technologies such as the quantum sensing ones that I told you about today. So the next time you see random things happening, you're in a grocery store and there aren't so many people, there are lots of people, you see a bunch of cars on the road and they're all clumped together, you see a bunch of trees and they're all planted kind of spaced apart and you want to know why this is happening. I urge you to think about things in terms of correlations. Think about these aggregate effects as a way of understanding individual behavior that somehow by zooming out and looking at global properties, you can understand the behavior of individual things and really use this correlation framework for understanding lots of things in your everyday life. And then maybe, just maybe, when this happens, you'll remember my talk, you'll put on your quantum hat and you'll look at this framework and say, how would the world be different if there were quantum correlations everywhere?